You may be seated. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, uh, we bow our hearts and seek your face this morning. Uh, That's why we're here. We're here to worship and to seek your face. We pray that you would visit with us during this time, that you would uh, touch us with your peace, your strength, your joy. Uh, Remind us of your love. Uh, Thank you, Lord, this morning that we were able to sing about your grace being enough enough and amazing grace. And we thank you that that has come to us through the spirit of grace and the grace uh, that's in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, He's your grace uh, to each and every one of us who believe. And so we uh, thank you this morning, Lord, that we can come before your throne (coughs) in prayer. Uh, Thank you for the reminder this morning that you love us, that we're in the beloved, that you constantly live to make intercession for us. Uh, We're uh, we're the saints of God. We're the beloved of God. Uh, We're friends of God. Uh, We're joint heirs. Uh, We're part of your eternal family. And we can't begin uh, to comprehend uh, this grace, uh, this uh, so great a salvation, uh, we only touch the hem of a garment, Lord, this morning, uh, in our hearts and our minds and our lives and our thoughts. Uh, but we know that God is for us. And if you're for us, Lord, who can be against us? And so we bless you uh, for your presence here this morning. We thank you for allowing us to enter your presence and to Uh, to pray to the God of heaven, um, the one who has eternally loved us. Uh, Father, uh, may you quiet all of our hearts and minds this morning. Uh, May we be ever still and know that you're God. We we pray that we would sense your presence in this place, that you would encourage each heart, uh, that we would find great emotional and spiritual strength uh, in you this morning. Uh, not in our, of ourselves, but in you, and uh, that our hearts would be full and uh, strengthened uh, in the faith that you've uh, shed abroad in our hearts. Uh, Father, we want to lift up the Shirtliff family. Uh, thank you so much for them. Uh, thank you so much for uh, Mike's spirit, uh, the grace that you sent to him so long ago. Uh, Thank you that he has the gift of eternal life. As uh, when I visited with him, as he said, my Lord and my Savior. And so, Father, I pray that you would lift up Mike this morning. Uh, May great joy and great peace be upon his life and heart as he struggles from day to day. And also, Father, too, I want to lift up Carol, uh, that she might uh, find herself... uh, resting uh, quietly in your great grace and in your love during this time. Uh, Also, we pray that you would uh, impart wisdom for decisions that have to be made uh, medically as well. Uh, Also, Father, too, I want to lift up uh, Sandy this morning, uh, afresh Sandy Sherman. Encourage her heart. Thank you for the love and the care, the support that she receives from her family daily. And um, we pray that um, the joy of the Lord would be her strength. And uh, we thank you for her witness, uh, for her love for the saints, her love for this church, her love for you. And um, so we pray that you would uplift her this morning as well. And also uh, pray that you would touch Fred Legler, uh, bring healing to his legs. uh, And uh, may he seek your face during this time. Uh, Also, Father, too, uh, I think of Edith Perfetti this morning. I think of Chuck Davis. Um, I think of Matt and Martha Brush. 
um, may, may we not forget them uh, with Martha's recovery. Encourage them as well. And uh, Father, for uh, those who um, who greatly struggle during this time, um, a time of uh, craziness, a time of chaos, uh, a time of hardship, uh, and. Um, and we know, Lord, that times are going to get harder. So we, um, we pray that we would, we would all draw close to you um, during these times and in the days ahead. Uh, also, Father, too, we want to lift up our country. Uh, we don't want to forget our country. Uh, the elected officials, uh, the officials that are in over us, we ask that uh, you would stop the craziness uh, that you would divinely intervene. Uh, we, we give you them. Uh, we pray that you would visit them uh, with your spirit of grace and mercy and uh, ask for a transforming mindset, a spirit of uh, transformation um, uh, with these people, the way they think and the way they do apart from you. Uh, we, we lift up our country and uh, we give it into your hands, Lord. Um, also, Father, too, uh, pray for spiritual revival uh, to take place uh, in this place and throughout our country uh, with each heart here and throughout the communities, uh, throughout our families. Um, our loved ones that, uh, that have walked away from you, that don't seem to give you the care or mind, uh, we lift them up as well. Again, we thank you for this time. We lift up all these prayers in the matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name I pray. Amen. Okay. Uh, at this particular time, we have a scripture reading. Dave? This morning's first scripture readings are from Paul's letters. The first one to the Galatians, chapter 2, verses 19 through 21. And if you're using a red church Bible, that can be found on page 1129. The second one will be from Paul's letter to the Corinthians. The fifth chapter, verses 14 through 17, and that you can find on page 1122. Again, from the book of Galatians, the second chapter, verses 19 through 21. Paul writes, For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. And from 2 Corinthians, Paul writes, For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is now here. May the Lord add his blessing.
for the reading of his word. Our second reading this morning is from the Gospel of John, the 15th chapter, verses 1 to 11. It's found on page 1046 of the Red Church Bible. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given to you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is the gospel of our Lord. Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we give you this time. Uh, may your Holy Spirit be our teacher and our guide, and may you give us insight and understanding into the things, Lord, that you've laid upon my heart. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So folks, if I said to you this morning, let's change places. You come up here, and I'll take your seat. How about that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I've got one taker. I, I've sat where you've sat, okay? Uh, if I were to say to you, you take my place, I'll take your place, right? We would swap out physically. That's what we would do. But you would still be the same person, and I would be the same person. And you would say, praise God, I'm not going to be like Pastor Jerry. And I would say amen that I'm not going to be like them, all right? That's what we would say. But now if I say to you, now walk in my shoes and I'll walk in your shoes. We'd probably both be really uncomfortable, wouldn't we? Like physically, if we changed shoes. Remember when you were younger, everyone's at least tried on somebody else's shoes at some point, right? And you ever, you think, good Lord, how do they walk in these things? It's because they've worn their shoes a certain way. They might have a higher arch, a lower arch. You understand, you tried it before. It doesn't work. Uh, what's, what, not a good fit, right? Now, if I were to use that same metaphor of walking in the shoes and say, well, let's, let's exchange places in life, that's entirely something different. Now we're beyond the physical shoes, and we've exchanged life, lives again, or at least... I'm trying to walk where you've walked. I started to think about this. Not only would that be uncomfortable for you and me, but I think that we would all find it awkwardly awkward. Is that a, is that a phrase or a word? Awkwardly awkward? I, I tell you, if I walked in your circles, I'm not sure 
how to relate to people because I don't, I don't know them. I wouldn't know how to interact with your family members. <laughs> They're not my family. The environment would be so different, wouldn't it? It would actually be a very strange and bizarre experience, awkwardly awkward. And I would submit to you that we would both say, hey, give me the physical shoes again. I'd rather walk in your physical shoes. You see, because it's easier than exchanging <coughs> lives with one another. By way of analogy, I think that that's how we approach the Christian life. We opt for the shoes of Jesus rather than opting for his life. Now, walking in Jesus' shoes really doesn't work just in the same way walking in someone else's shoes doesn't work. But we understand the concept. And that's why we would choose the shoes over his life. Because, see, the exchanged life is something that, in Christ, that we don't really understand. And we find it uh, strangely unfamiliar. Maybe not bizarre, but unfamiliar. And sometimes we don't know how to relate and act and interact in, that, in, in, in his life. And it's awkwardly awkward because it's often misunderstood. We're not really sure where his life begins and where it ends in our own life. Sometimes it's just like a ball of spaghetti. It's all mixed up. So we're actually comfortable to stay in uncomfortable shoes. This morning, I am picking up on the exchanged life in death through resurrection. And this is part three, the resurrection part. And I'm going to try to get to the heart of what is, uh, what the exchange life means, what it looks like, and what it feels like. Now, before I do that, I want to summarize the two messages, because maybe you haven't heard them, or you weren't here. Uh, the exchange life is a term that was coined by Hudson Taylor, the missionary to the China Inland Mission, but it essentially summarizes the work of Christ in death and in life for the believer. It's a catch-all phrase. You know that God took your place at Calvary, vicarious and substitutionary. By him dying at the cross, you're able to die, your sins die with him. You, you, your life is hitting God. You understand that. He goes to the cross, he pays for our sins so we don't have to. Christ, when he ascends, sends the Holy Spirit as another helper to help us live the Christian life. He's the through part. So we have the cross part, the death part. We have the Holy Spirit as the through part. And our lives are to be lived through him because he is the very real presence of Christ in us. So when we come to the resurrection part, God also takes our place in life, just as he did at the cross. And in, in that it's vicarious and it's substitutionary. He it exchanges life. He indwells each believer, and as Paul said, so it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And so what, what God did redemptively is he's, in, he's transactioned and completed the exchanged life. His life for mine and mine for his. It's a swap out. And so it, his life, the resurrected life, him living in me, is as just as vicarious and substitutionary as when he went to the cross. You know, uh, there are some Christians who struggle with understanding that God died for all of their sins at Calvary. And they still try to do penance. <laughs> and it doesn't work. When you understand that Christ took our place at the cross, you're free. Amen? You're free. And when we understand that Christ has given us the exchanged life through the power of the Holy Spirit and Christ living in us the hope of glory, then we understand that it's, it, it's transformational. It's totally transformational, and it was meant to be that, and it was meant to be as vicarious and substitutionary as all our sins at the cross. It's supposed to be every detail of our life. Uh, he wants to live through us, and he wants to live for himself. 
Uh, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And it's the I am part, his living presence, that I would dare say that we all find very elusive. We find his living presence elusive. That's because we do what Hudson Taylor once did long, so long ago. We bring the I part to the Christian life, and we neglect the I am part. Now, last week, I left you with a clue. Does anybody remember the clue? I stood up here swinging a clean handkerchief. I want to emphasize clean, okay? I, I waved it, and, and I said surrender. That was the key, right? That was the key word or the clue that I left with you. And if you remember, I said that surrender, there's more to it than just surrender. And what I meant by that is this. There's more to it than standing here waving a white flag. Surrender's more than that. And in the Christian life, it's beyond surrendering to a set of do's and don'ts. That's the easy part. If you tell me do's and don'ts, I can identify a parameter of what I can do, and when I go outside of that, what I can't do. Surrendering to Christ is way bigger than that. Do's and don'ts are for the legalists. It's for people who want to stifle your spiritual life in Christ. You can't do this, you can't do that. You must do this, you shouldn't do that. When I talk about surrendering, and it being more than do's and don'ts, we're talking about surrendering to a person. It's the Lord Jesus Christ who lives within. It's his will, not my will, and that's the hard part. It's like Siamese twins. You know, you got kind of two heads, two different wills, two thoughts, and where are you going to go? That's, that's harder than do's and don'ts. To give up your will and your desires and your heart for another person. Charles Stanley wrote, quote, a spirit-filled life is a life of surrender, of yielding oneself to God's control. R.A. Torrey, American evangelist and pastor, wrote, Quote, the Spirit guides us in the details of daily life and service as to where to go and where not to go and what to do and what not to do. Now, I want you to think about this. I think most under, uh, Christians understand the doctrinal part of the Holy Spirit living within and Christ living within, but we miss the spiritual part. We say amen to what Stanley and Tory wrote. We understand the doctrinal part. But, but practically speaking, as they say today, I'm just not feeling it. And that's where the disconnect is with many of us. It's not something we can always spiritually relate to. Theologically, doctrinally, I got it. He lives within. The question is, does he live without? Does he ooze from without? Uh, Charles Stanley wrote this 25 years ago. I don't, I don't know how old he is today. I think he's well up into his 80s. Uh, but 25 years ago, he said, quote, I had spent years, listen to this, I spent years studying God's word, but my life was limited because I had not developed my relationship with the Holy Spirit. Thus, his work in my life was limited. Now, I'm here to tell you, I think that we can all relate to the limited part this morning. Amen? We can. We don't like to admit it, but we can. And what happens is we relegate him to the co-pilot position. We want to drive, he's in the driver's seat. And so what happens is we influence his control by not surrendering. We bring the I part. Now, I don't know about you, but... When I'm in a car with somebody, I like to drive. I have this better sense of uh, my surroundings. I don't know what they're thinking, <laughs> so I want to be in control. That's just the, the, the reality of it. It works for me. But that's the I part. 
and, and, and there's a, a lack of trust when I give it over to somebody else. Many pastors and Christian teachers will mention the surrender part, but they really never tell us now, do they, about how to surrender. They don't give us those details. They just say surrender. So I ask the question, how does, how does one surrender? I mean, Stanley spoke of yielding oneself. What does that look like? Are there practical tips in getting there? So I don't, I don't know about you, but I am a very slow learner. I refer to myself as stiff-necked, kind of like the Hebrews. I'm persevering to a fault, and I mean a fault. And surrendering is not in my DNA, nor is yielding in my DNA. So I say to myself, well, what does a surrender look like? How, how do you do that? Because it's hard. And I, so this morning, I want to know the how part. I, because I, I'm here today to tell you that I want to fully surrender to God. That's something that I want to do. You say, well, pastor, you're, you're a pastor. You've done that, right? <laughs> Not really. I want to yield to him. I want to put him first in everything. I want to be persevering in him, not in my own strength. So that's why I ask such questions like, how does one surrender? What does it look like? Are there practical tips? Take a look at John chapter 15. I think John 15 possesses the key to answering some of these questions, not all, but some of these questions. We don't have time to count, but eight times... In 11 verses, Jesus uses the word abide or abides. Abides is used once, I think. Abide is used seven times. We have a total of eight times. The key phrase is found in verse 4. Abide in me. If we understand this phrase, because it's foundational to understanding surrender. If we understand this phrase... I believe that we're able to tap into the resurrected, exchanged life in him more fully. So what I'm saying here is abide in me is the spiritual secret to the Christian life. It's the I am. That's what it is. It's abiding in the person of Jesus. When we choose to abide in him... We've chosen to surrender to him. If we abide, we surrender. And abiding and surrendering are kind of two sides to the same coin. It's a daily thing. It's also a momentary thing. And it's also learned behavior. Now, I'm not going to have time to get into the learned behavior part. I might tackle that maybe next week or two. I'm not really sure. However, God leads. And I don't want to split hairs here this morning, but we can also talk actively and talk about his life being active and passive in the moment or throughout the day. There are some times that God says, speak, and there are other times he says, listen. <laughs> There's other times where he says, move, and there are other times it's like, wait. That, you know, that's maybe perhaps for another message as well. Now, the other thing is, if you were with us the other week, I had mentioned that this passage is uh, misinterpreted by a number of believers. There's essentially two interpretations. One is that somebody looks at this and says, you can lose your salvation. That's a wrong interpretation. The context doesn't bear it out. This is about spiritual fruitfulness for those who are saved. You cannot lose your salvation. Can you not be fruitful in the Christian life? Absolutely. And that's what Jesus is going after here. So uh, it's possible not to be spiritually fruitful. It's impossible to lose your salvation. Now, there's another 
way to wrongly look at this passage. And I think I've done that for quite some time. So we can interpret this passage correctly, and we can say it's about spiritual fruitfulness, not loss of salvation, but we can wrongly interpret and limit this parable to the written word of God when it comes to fruitfulness. Let me say that again. We can wrongly interpret and limit this parable to the written word of God when it comes to fruitfulness. And we need to understand that fruitfulness applies to the living word of God, not the written word of God. That's very, very important. So what, what is the difference between the written word and the living word? The written word is what's in this book. The living word is the one who resides in each of our hearts. That's the difference. One is the written word, the other is the living word. One is an inanimate object where the Spirit of God uses these words to bring life and, and understanding to what is truth and what is and what should be. And yet the person living within is the one who actually energizes our hearts and our spirits and our souls. So this book here, if you're using a KG, KJV version, 7, 781,000 137 words. There are also 3,116,480 letter characters found. That's the written word. That's not the living word. And the living word is the person of Jesus Christ. And God is so much, much more than the living word, than the written word, is he not? I mean, the scripture says that 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 all of heaven and earth cannot contain him. And yet sometimes we reduce him to what is written in a book. Now, stay with me on this. Why, why is it a mistake to limit this parable in terms of fruitfulness to the written word? I want you to think of this as like an autobiography or a biography about God. His work in the world. It helps us to understand the person of God, his likes, his dislikes, his life, his heart, his goals, his attitude, his perspective. If you were to read a biography or an autobiography of a person, you start to get to know that person a little bit more. But here's the problem. It's only a written record. It's not him. I, I challenge anybody to tell me that this is God. It's not. It's a word from God. And fruitfulness does not come from a written word. It comes from the person of Christ. So, so how do we understand the Bible here? The Bible is a written word. It's a spiritual framework on how to live. But it's way different from him who's living in me and you. And the Bible figures into us knowing God's commandments. Take a look at verse 10. Because Jesus said, if you keep my commands, you will abide in my love. It, it teaches us that when we keep his word, relationally we experience joy and we experience his love. And we can dispense of that joy and that love. Now, think of it in this way, too. Who keeps the written word? For simplicity's sake, let's reduce this entire Bible down to two commandments. Love the Lord your God, all your heart, soul, mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Because that's what Jesus did, right? Now, you tell me who in this place has kept the word of God in its entirety like that. No one keeps it perfectly except Jesus. So again, look at, look at this parable. Take a look at verse 4. And this is, this is huge, folks. Abide in me, 
I want you to notice that Jesus starts with himself, not the written record. You see that? He starts with himself, the living word. He does not start with the Bible. Fruitfulness comes from the person of God living within. It doesn't come from reading the Bible. In fact, if you go over to Galatians 5, the scripture says it's the fruit of the Spirit. It's not the fruit of the written word. It's the fruit of the Spirit. Jesus is talking about his person, the Spirit of Jesus living within. And I want you to notice here that in the parable, he moves from the living word himself, and then he moves down to the written word, verse 10. And so the way we understand this is, we have the person of God, he's given us a spiritual framework, and within that framework, when we abide in him, his life, and his words, love and joy flow out. So it's all about fellowship, it's all about relationship. But spiritual fruit comes from a person. And, and so as I look at this passage, this is what I think Jesus is saying. When he says, abide in me, I think he's going beyond the letter of the book, the law, the written word. Because he had to die because we couldn't keep it. And he goes to his person who lives within. And he's stressing that he is the life. And I think that's where we as believers fall short. And he stressed this truth back in John chapter 6. Uh, the bread of life discourse, this is what he said. John chapter 6, verse 56. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. Now, Jesus wasn't talking about cannibalism. We know that. He was not speaking literally. He was speaking spiritually in terms of metaphors. His flesh, his flesh is his word. It's manna. It's bread. It's teaching. But his blood is the life-giving spirit of his life from within. And it's entering his life spiritually. It's the resurrected life realized. When we feed on him, and we, if we eat his bread and drink his blood, eat his body, drink his blood, the imagery is feeding on the word of God and living in the life of Jesus Christ. It's possible to feed on manna, bread, his body, and not take his life-giving properties from it. You know that. You can read the Word of God and get nothing out of it. People do it all day long. Hey, you go over to John chapter 4 in the, same, in the same gospel. Jesus used a living waters metaphor for the woman at the well. What did he say to her? I'm the living water. That's what he said. In John chapter 15, if you carry the analogy over, you know, uh, the, the, the blood, drinking the blood, the living water, uh, from, the, from the parable of the vine and the branches, we would be talking about sap. Spiritual life. It's spiritual life that comes from the Spirit of God. And in all these three scriptures, in John 4, John 6 and John 15, Jesus is pointing to a spiritual life of Christ flowing from within to without. That's the life. Jesus lives within so we can live within the written word because I can't do this in myself and neither can you. But he also lives within so we can live beyond the written word in him. Because we can't do this in and of ourselves. So what I'm saying here is this. Do not look at spiritual fruitfulness simply through the eyes of a book. Look at spiritual fruitfulness from the eyes of a person. It's a relational viewpoint. Now, here's the other thing. I don't want you to 
walk away from here this morning thinking, oh, the pastor's lost it. I'm not suggesting that Scripture is irrelevant. Uh, I've been with you too long to, for you to know that. This is a divine book. But I, I am suggesting, I am suggesting that Jesus made it very, very clear that you can live within this framework and never receive anything, but if you live within him, you receive everything. This framework is a framework. It's divine. You go outside of it, you get burned. You go outside of it, you lose your joy. You go outside of it, you lose the love of Christ. That's what a false teacher would say. Oh, you can do anything you want. Go outside of it. It's okay. God loves you. Jesus is saying, you do that, you cut off the sap. You cut off the life-flowing blood. What I am suggesting here is this. I'm not suggesting that the Word of God is irrelevant. I'm suggesting that there is more to the person of God than just reading the Bible. That's what I'm suggesting. And I think that this is where we get hung up as Christians. We try to live the written word and we fail because we don't defer to him who lives within. We embrace the letter of the law, so to speak, and we totally miss the spirit of Christ and all his power and all his glory. So abiding needs to translate to surrendering and yielding to his person. He is the means. So the question is, how is it done? Uh, Pastor Dowd used to say, I'm glad you asked. How is it done? So this is what I'll give you in terms of my thoughts. And by no means have I uh, arrived or accomplished it. Surrendering is a relative term. It's conditional and it's situational. That's why it's relative. I'll give you an example. In, 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 on September 2nd, 1945, General Douglas MacArthur officiated a ceremony where the Japanese officially surrendered to the Allied powers. The ceremony was billed the Japanese Surrender. As many of you know, it happened on the USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay the ceremony took 23 minutes. Now listen, this is important. But that was just the written agreement. That was just the terms. The surrender was the terms. The yielding came in more tangible ways after the 23 minutes. You know, everything, you know, relationally, where we helped Japan get back up on their feet, and work together, and yada, yada, yada. But what I'm saying here is, that's just an agreement. It took 23 minutes. Surrender does not happen in 23 minutes. Well, it, it may happen ceremonially, but it takes a long time to yield. Now, it was conditional, it was situational. You do this, we get along. Now, this is where I think Paul referred to it as situational and conditional. Uh, a verse that I shared with you last week, Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. He said, not that I have already obtained it, but I press on. He's talking about the resurrected life. It means I surrendered at a ceremonial point. And it also means, too, at a certain point, I am continuing along in Jesus, the situational part. So I think Paul understood conditional and situational. I press on is the yielding part. Let me, let me kind of make it a little bit more personal if I can. Back in 1981, I accepted the Lord Jesus as my Savior. I surrendered. It took about five minutes in the pastor's office. I accepted Christ as my Savior. The ceremonial part. I thought that was it. I thought I surrendered, I yielded, I was done. And then a year and a half later, God's tapping on my heart 
and says, I want you to be a pastor. And so I walked the aisle to Bible school to, to answer the call to Bible school. And when I walked the aisle, I thought I surrendered and I thought I yielded. And then after that, because I didn't want to go to seminary, I went to seminary. And I thought I surrendered and I thought I yielded. And again, uh, that's what I thought. And now for the last 30, going on 32 years, I've been doing the pastoral thing. And I can tell you that that is not the yielding and the surrendering. Accepting Christ is the ceremonial part, but the yielding starts to come over a real long period of time. And during those 32 years and during this time that I've been a Christian, I've surrendered and I've yielded and I've surrendered and I've yielded time and time and time again. And this is what I've learned. The surrendering and the yielding part has always been and always will be about responding daily and momentarily to the Lordship of Christ. That's surrendering and yielding. Because when He's got us daily and momentarily, we generally don't go kicking and screaming. And when he's got us daily and momentarily, then he has the preeminence and he's able to live freely. I have to let him live. And that is the only way possible. When I choose to abide in my resurrected Savior daily and momentarily, then that's the surrendering and the yielding time and time and time again. Remember the other week I said to you, it's not God as co-pilot. It's not even God as pilot as I've been thinking about it. It's God wanting to live his life. That's all it is. God wants to, he wants to be Christ in you and through you. That, that's what he wants people to see, Christ. Not you, not me, but Christ. So, what does it look like? What does it feel like? I think I know what it feels like. I think I know what it looks like. Now, when I say feel like, I'm not suggesting feelings only. We don't, we're, we don't trust our feelings. Nor am I suggesting a feeling. Although I think it is feelings and I think it is a feeling, but I think it's more than that. I think it's a recognition and a realization of his person, moment by moment. I'm suggesting that we tap into his presence moment by moment. This is what I think in, it looks like and feels like. So this is how I understand it. The life of Christ within me is full and complete. The same is with you. Charles Stanley used the word develop. God doesn't need to be developed. God doesn't need to be cultivated. You and I do. We need to be cultivated. And this is how I think it's done. Because I've been reflecting on this for a number of weeks now. You know where in Psalm 46, verse 10, God says, Be still and know that I am God. That, that great passage, right? Right? The abiding and the surrendering leads to a stillness. Stillness is a state of mind and heart and soul. That's what it is. You can be still physically, but that's not what Jesus is talking about. That's not what God is talking about. When he says be still, it's a state of heart, mind, and soul. Be still and know that he is God. Now, as I was reflecting on this, I couldn't help but think of Martha and Mary. You know the account of Martha and Mary, right? Martha's running around doing all sorts of act. She's consumed with activity. She was not still physically, nor was she still spiritually. She was worried with care. She was not still before her Lord. Conversely, and I, by the way, and I think that that's a picture of Doing and stress in one's environment. That's what I think it is. 
It's stress and doing in one's environment. That's also for another message. But what did Jesus say about Mary? She chose the better part, right? If you think about it, Mary was still before the Lord physically, but it was more than just that. It wasn't limited to physical stillness, because that's, stillness is not defined physically. Mary is a picture of stillness. She sits at Jesus' feet, but she's still spiritually, and she's still, she's focused on God. That's what it is. Being still is spiritual. You can be still physically and not still spiritually, but if you're still spiritually, you may be running around physically or you may not be. But I know this, spiritual stillness is, involves knowing that he is God in the moment. That's what I know. I've, over the last several weeks, I've had moments of stillness where I've been doing, and I'm telling you, the peace is off the charts. And there are times where I physically have sat there doing nothing except meditating, and the peace has been off the charts. So it's not about physical stillness. It's about spiritual and mental, mental stillness. It's finding God spiritually in the moment. That's what it is. Recognizing his life and yielding to him. That's what it is. Give me a few more minutes. I'm, I know I'm running late. Scripture tells us that we have the mind of Christ. We have the living word within. We have the written word, the framework. And I would submit to you that every single one of us as believers has the ability to recognize his presence, his voice, his thoughts, and his life in the moment. You know it because you've lived it, even though it's been momentary. We have the ability to recognize it and recognize him. It's way easier to do that when we're physically still, where I can have, say, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes sit there where nobody ever bothers me, the phone doesn't ring, nobody comes in the room. Good luck with that, doing that 24-7. You can't live 24-7 and physically be still. That's why spiritual stillness is in the moment. Spiritual stillness is resting and abiding in the resurrected Savior. It's yielding. And when we're still before him, then he's able to live. In his life, in that moment, may be active or passive. He may say to me, speak. And he may say to me, be long-suffering. He may say to me, do. And he may say to me, don't do. But it comes down to what he wants. This is why I think Paul talked about bringing every thought captive. Every thought captive. Is God in it? Am I to be passive? Am I to be active? What does he want? So the, the exchanged life, the resurrected part, is where Jesus says to each one of us, let's change places. And it's beyond the shoes part. You see, we want to walk in his shoes. We're willing to walk in his shoes because even though it's not really comfortable, we get the shoe concept. But he's talking about way more than that. He says, I took your place at the cross. I've taken your place in here. I've, take, I've, lit, I've come to dwell in here, and I've come to take your place in life. So you take my place, my life, and you'll be glad you did. And I believe that if we all did this, if we all learned this better daily, momentarily, we would all more fully know 
the power of the resurrected exchanged life. We would all be radically transformed. We would see tremendous change in our life and our heart. Like, like Hudson Taylor. That's what he came to understand. That God lives within, and I think he understood that, and it became a learned behavior of daily and momentarily finding God in the moment. And so he lived in the presence of the great I am. And I think that's, I think that's the transformational life. That's the, ex that's the exchanged life. And, 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 and I said this before, busyness is the enemy of the soul. Doing, doing, doing all the time. We're not meant to do all the time. We're not machines, we're not robots. God said, be still. And we can do that sitting, but how do you do that 24-7? You can't. Rigor mortis would set in. God says, be still and know that I am he in the moment. That's the life. That's how we tap into it. That's what God has laid upon my heart. Um, I hope and pray. Uh, this wasn't an easy, easy message to try to communicate, but I hope and pray that, that he's taken you into a fuller understanding of what it means to abide in him. Abide in me, and you'll bear much fruit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, amazing that the Lord Jesus would be willing to come and die and take our place at Calvary. Uh, amazing that he would send his spirit to live and indwell our hearts. And even incredibly more amazing that you would want to live in and through us each and every day, this sinful body, uh, but we thank you that the, the transformation has begun. Uh, may, we, may we have the understanding of the exchanged life. May we understand that it's all by your grace. May we understand that we simply have to surrender to, uh, to abide in you and to yield um, momentarily, day by day. And uh, we, and as we're still before you, we'll be, uh, we'll experience your transformational power. Uh, we thank you for this time. We thank you for these scriptures. We thank you for your Holy Spirit being our teacher and our guide. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.